Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam spoke to him and said, "It is you." So you're creating your own movie. Am I? Am I the one going crazy here? Has he told you to say that? Then treat me like a wicked person. I don't care. Are you a paid agent? May the curse of Allah subhanahu wa taala be upon the liar. The Imam Mahdi, a prominent figure in Islamic eschatology, who has come to save the world from corruption and oppression. Now, today's guest not only believes that Imam Mahdi has arrived and is walking the earth, but he knows him personally. It's time to get unchained. Nasa, welcome to the show, bro. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tell me a bit about yourself, your background, and um, how did it all lead up to you believing you know who the Imam Mahdi is? Okay, so uh, as I introduce myself, my name is Nasser. Um, I don't claim to be an Imam or a scholar, not even a student of knowledge. I'm just uh, a simple Muslim, a simple Ummati of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. And um, throughout my life, I've had my journey. I've I've been in many different religions. And one of the things that I find that is key is understanding the direction in which I am going and is it right or wrong. I believe that we only have two choices in life and that is to make the right choice or the wrong choice. So going forward, um, I went through my journey, passing through multiple religions, eventually ending up to what I believe is the truth. So um, in, in all of this journey, I came across many dreams throughout my life as a child, as an adult, even in the actions of me as a child. For example, um, I didn't know anything about Islam as a child. As a very, very young child, I know nothing about Islam. Um, but in the middle of the night, and I remember it like it happened yesterday, that I'd be standing up in my underwear, just, you know, as a child, I'm, I go to sleep in my underwear, and I'd get up in the middle of the night, and I don't know what I'm doing. But I make the actions where I go down onto the floor and I put my head to the floor and then I stand up. I don't even sit up like we do when we pray as Muslims traditionally. But I just got up, sat there and then put my head to the ground. And I, I, I never understood what I was doing at that age. So this is just out of instinct when just you were a child? Of, just as a child out of instinct, this is what, something that would happen with me. So now I understand what I was doing. I understand that something was prompting me to do those motions and now I identify that as praying. Mm. I didn't learn about Islam until I, I got a bit older. Um, and my whole, the whole thing surrounding me, I, I, did, I wasn't circumcised until later on. I wasn't circumcised as a child. It, was, it came when I was a bit older. So, you know, I didn't have this typical Muslim upbringing, you know. Um, and nor was my family when we were very, very young, religious. It was not that kind of environment. So I didn't have this kind of exposure everyone else had. I'm not even uh, a full Pakistani. Yeah. I'm half Indian and half Pakistani. There's a class of cultures there. During the 80s, you know, there was a lot of problems between the Indians and the Pakistanis, the Hindus and the Muslims. This is something that I found in my life. It's been a battle. Even to this day, I feel like this situation, it doesn't get any better. But in Islam, we know that there's going to be a period called Ghazwat al-Hind. There's going to be a, win a war against the polytheists. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I, feel like <clears throat> I feel like that this is actually a part of me. That I am having to see both sides of me engage in this. And this is one of the difficult things about why I, it's been difficult for me to go through life. I saw Muslims, I, I'll keep it quite brief, but I've, I've saw the Muslims in my life growing up, nothing but anger, aggression, uh, always hard-hearted. There was no love involved in this. And from the Hindu side of things, uh, I saw love, I saw caring, and I saw this lovely nature. They were successful, they were always happy, they were always smiling. And I naturally drew towards love. That's what I did. And so be it. That's what happened with me. So f this is where my journey through the religion started. But I had to understand what love was to, to know how it feels. Over the course of my life, I came to a period where I said to myself, you know what's very interesting is that when I pray in the traditional manner to Allah, I don't feel a connection with him. And why is this? Like, surely if you pray to the creator, what, you should be able to feel a connection with him. So I always asked this question and I continued my journey 
And I call it hidayah, the, the path that Allah puts you on. And I kept going. And as I was going through life, I started experiencing different things and started understanding the different perceptions and perspectives. And I have a broad understanding of life as a human being going through the journey that it goes through. So I have a, a vast array of experience and, and I don't take anyone's experience as something that is un unvaluable. I believe it's one of the most valuable things in life. So um, I came to Islam and I fell in love with it. What led you to start believing this uh, man is uh, an Imam Mehdi? I dreamt about this individual when I was younger, as a child. And as I was going through my journey, I actually came across, he came into my path. But I looked at it and I actually investigated into it just naturally, not looking at the Quran and looking at the verses. No, I actually looked into it generally as a as an interest. I was like, what is this guy saying? Like, why has he appeared here out of nowhere? And he's say, claiming that he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him and he spoke back and that Prophet Muhammad has come into his dream so many times. So I thought to myself, this is very interesting. So what did, what obviously me at that time, I was into things like the Arrival series and looking into all these sort of things. This is where I was at the time. I was just investigating. <clears throat> so he came across and I said to myself, this is interesting. And then I started looking into it. I didn't just blindly accept everything he was saying. The first thing I wanted to do was know what he looked like because when he first released his videos, there was no pictures of him anywhere. Mm. No one knew what he looked like. And that for me is a form of protection for him because when people see him, they say, this guy can't be the Mahdi. But they didn't do their research. They based it upon the way that he looks. They based a ju they judged a book by its cover. Now me, I did my research. I looked into this man, what he's saying. Does it contradict the Quran? Does it contradict the Hadith? What is he saying? Is it in line with what's going on today? Are we living at the right times for these sort of things to occur? And yes, we are. I believe that we are. So I did my istikhara after doing all my research. And I still had some doubts. But after my istikhara, my doubts were removed. And it's not that I just blindly believe this guy to be the Mahdi. I have been consistently trying to prove everything about him is a lie and everything is wrong. I haven't come into this with any understanding that if he is somebody who is a liar, then I'm going to still stay here. That's, ir that's illogical. Who does that? Not me. So people who, when I go on lives and I speak about him to the, to, to, to the world and, and, and try to tell people there's a man who's having dreams, go look into it. And they come forward with all their arguments. And I, I take the ones that I've never seen before. And then I go and try my best to prove what they have shown to me, to him. Because for some reason, they don't go to him directly, but I do. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I do. I'm doing my diligence here. So I've, I've taken their arguments and said, okay, let me see if this actually is something that I can use to try and prove him wrong. And it doesn't prove him wrong. Every so, single time it So works. people are probably wondering uh, who this man is you're talking about. What's, what's his name? So his name is Muhammad Qasim bin Abdul Karim. He's a 47-year-old man who lives in Lahore in Pakistan. He's a Qureshi. Um, that's who he is. He's, a, he's been having dreams from a very, very young age. Um, he's 47 years old now. He started spreading his dreams at the age of 40. And the dreams contain help in the, in, in the sense that it reminds us about Tawheed, coming back to Tawheed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said to him, Qasim, the world has never been filled with as much shirk as it has ever been filled with before. Now that's a big thing for, for to say, but also it does not contradict the Quran because we know this. Because the time of Nuh alayhi salam, it was so full that Allah washed the earth. After the dua of Nuh alayhi salam, he, he, he washed the whole earth and he only left those people who were believing. And we have come back to it again. We understand that shirk and its forms have evolved. So today, why have we stopped thinking that has evolved? We Have we not moved from the industrial age into the electrical age? Can things not now become digital? Can we not see things in a different light? Mm. The Quran we know has been sent for every single generation from the start when it first came to the end of time. So if this is true and it is for every generation, why do we not think that the Quran will apply to this time too? Do we not, should we not look at it from this perspective? We're not living 1400 years ago. It don't make sense. So let me get one thing straight. Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is coming into his dreams. Yeah, so uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has spoken to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his dreams and he has also seen uh, the light of Allah. It's a nur. He's never seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in how we will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah. Those people who will get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He hasn't seen him like this. There but is many, a veil. Many people have dreams. So what's the difference between Muhammad and any other person who may be having dreams? So, so there is no difference. There is one distinct bit of information which differentiates what he is doing and everybody else. He's being commanded by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to spread his dreams. And actually, on the first time he was commanded to do it, he said, 
no, he didn't want to do it. And he stopped. Mm. And then he came back to it again after being commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go and spread the dreams. And then he started and he didn't stop. And we're nine years later now. How do we know that he's being truthful, that he's having these dreams? So we know in Islam that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the future. And if only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone knows the future, and he shows somebody something in their dream, and then that starts to come true, then this can only be from Allah, because shaitan does, himself does not know the future. So whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills to know the future, these are the people who are permitted to know it. And Allah has commanded him to spread those dreams, and he's been spreading those dreams. But in, additional, in addition to this, the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has said in a hadith that the people who have the truest of dreams, meaning that you have a dream and it can, comes true and it happens on a regular basis, Right, those people who have those dreams called al mubashirat they have the truest of speech. This is from the Prophet. If you want to disagree with this, go ahead. You are denying the words of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, so you're saying he's had all of these dreams come true. What yes. sort of dreams have come true? So he spoke about COVID nineteen and the uh, fall of the economy. Uh, fall of the economy. This he's had this dream in 2017. It came true, obviously in 2019. He's had dreams about the floods that happened in Pakistan. He's, uh, and, and everyone will say these are predictable events. This is the thing that we keep hearing. Okay, that's fine. You can say that, but where is your evidence that this is a predictable event? Who predicted this? You will say people like Imran Hussein predicted this. They were doing very good research and investigation and coming to conclusions, but based on what? He is somebody who is not an individual who is Islamically intellectual. He is, I would call, an illiterate man in Islam. He doesn't know the Quran uh, like like you know, some people do. He's not a scholar, an imam. He doesn't claim to be anything like this. He's a simple guy, very, very simple guy. And he doesn't claim to have anything. There's no arrogance about him. He's very transparent. He says, like, you know, Allah knows best about everything. I'm just some a simple guy who Allah commanded me to spread my dreams. And that's all I'm doing. I see many people make the accusation that he doesn't pray. Is this true? No, it's not true. Because I know the man directly and I've been with him and I've seen him pray. So you have a primary witness here. I've been with him. I've seen him pray. I have led him in prayer, in fact. As well, and he's also led people in prayer as well. You know, it's just the, it's just a friendship that we have as well. Um, uh, you know, he's a very sincere and a humble guy. We don't revere him. We don't put him on any kind of pedestal or anything. Like I led him in prayer. If he was on a pedestal, I would have said, "Bro, Achi, please lead the prayer. Lead me, please." You know, this no, this doesn't happen with him. Whoever wants to lead the prayer will lead the prayer. And I know that some people will disagree with this, but this is just the way we were running at the time when we was over there. So I've seen him pray. People who say he doesn't pray, they don't. They haven't done enough knowledge. And actually, they watched maybe a part of an interview that he had a while ago. He was talking about his condition at that time. Can people not change? Do we not live in the future? Do people not change? If I was having all of these dreams of Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, coming into my dreams, what is it, 500 times or, or more? Yeah, 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 you're right, yeah. If I was having these dreams... I believe I would become the most devout Muslim. I would, uh, you know, do my prayers. You said that Muhammad does pray now. Um, you know, I would have a beard and I would live my life accordingly. Why is Muhammad Qasim not got a beard? This is one of the things that I find from the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu where he says that the Mahdi will resemble me in character. Al-Khuluq is the word that is used in Arabic, in conduct, in the way he is. Mm. Okay? Not in his appearance. To have a beard is to resemble the Prophet ﷺ. To have the most finest of hair is to resemble the Prophet ﷺ. To wear an imama, a turban, is to resemble the Prophet ﷺ. To wear the clothing that he wore, uh, this is all, a, this is the dress of the Prophet ﷺ. This is his appearance. So even in this hadith, he does not contradict it. So for me, this is a clear evidence that this man who who is very transparent, who does not hide away from him, he has those, those conducts. If you haven't spoken to the man or you've not even investigated about the man, to make a conclusion that this man does not look like the Mahdi based on your own preconceived conclusions with no evidence, it doesn't make sense. Find me a hadith where it says that the Mahdi will have a beard. Good luck. Good luck because I know where you have to look to find those and they will not be accepted by the ulama, especially the, the, amongst the Sunnis or the Salafis because they, they don't take these ones as evidence. They don't, they don't trust them. So the hadiths um, indicate that the Mahdi will, will come from the, the lineage of Fatima. 
I noticed you mentioned that um, Mohammed Qasim is actually a Qureshi. Is there any evidence of, of either? Yeah, so I've seen um, that he's a, a Qureshi. I, he's shown me his own evidences. Um, but he hasn't shown me because I said to him, show me proof that you're from the descendant of, of, of Hassan. <laughs> because if he showed me proof, then he is claiming that he's the Mahdi. He is not making such claims, nor has he, he ever said, I am the Mahdi. He has not said that I will be the Mahdi. He has not said, I'm trying to prove I'm the Mahdi. So why does he need to provide his lineage if he's not making any claims? The people around him have identified him as that specific individual. So I asked him, I says, what's your dad's name, bro? He says, oh, my name, his name was Abdul Karim Qureshi. I said, oh, bro, can I see, like, have you, like, got some, like, can I see, like, what his ID, what did he look like? He, said, he showed me his ID. He showed me his grandfather's stuff, he, and, he, and he continued. And I said, okay, fine, khalas. You know, you're a Qureshi. Just doing a simple uh, history search on uh, one hadith that the Prophet's family, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, he said that a calamity will befall my family after I am gone. They will be expelled and exiled from the land. You know, we know that the descendants of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of them married in a, a prince, a, a Persian princess, and another one married a Berber woman. So we can see that the Prophet's lineage moved out. They spread even further eastwards. And if you look where the Qureshis actually ended up, they ended up in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and, and some parts of India. And you can see the path of where they came. So the people from the Quraysh tribe have spread around the world. And actually, um, there are many people who are Qureshis. So to deny someone their lineage just because you don't have a piece of paper, what if you are wrong? You know, the, in Surah Al-Hujurat, verse 6, it says, in, if someone brings you news, inquire into it, lest you harm a people in ignorance. You not knowing is not sufficient for you to turn around and make a claim against them. But isn't that without, what people are doing when they're saying we want to see the evidence of his lineage? Of course it is, bro. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came, he split the moon in half and they still believe, disbelieved. How do you think mere layman people like me or even Muhammad Qasim showing you anything like this is going to give you a, 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 an understanding that this man is the Mahdi? It won't because you will just find the next thing to complain about. And the next thing that usually is complained about is the beard. It's the prayer. I mean, the prayer alone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said to him in a dream, if they ask about the prayer, tell them the prayer is for me to ask about because it is me whom the prayers are for. In the hadiths, actually, it says that the Mahdi will have uh, the same name as uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And his father's name will be Abdullah. Okay, so there's a difference, uh, there's a difference of opinion. What, what, is, what is uh, Muhammad Qasim's name and does it match up with that hadith? Yes, it does match up with the hadith. So his name is Muhammad Qasim ibn Abdul Karim. Okay, it matches up with the hadith. There is a difference of opinions of the scholars. Some of the scholars say that, that his name will be like, similar, or in agreement with, and others say it will have to match and be identical to Muhammad ibn Abdullah. But the thing is, in the hadith itself, it does not state the name of uh, the father of his father's name. How do we not know that we know that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had many names. He was also known as Qasim, but Muhammad Qasim's name is Muhammad, Muhammad. Okay, so we call him Muhammad Qasim or we call him Qasim. That's just how we call him. Now, uh, we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's family's uh, uh, father's name is Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Now, the word is you are to you in Arabic. If you look at things like sunnah.com, you have to look at the wording. When you look at the word you are to you, this is even explained by uh, a sheikh from uh, uh, Masjid al-Aqsa, uh, who is his native tongue is Arabic. Right, this is a sheikh from there. He even mentions about the explanation of the word you It does not mean the same as, it means similar to or in agreement with. The understanding is here is what is your intention when you're coming here? To blindly believe or to do your research and actually check it properly? So the general belief is that the, the Mahdi will be from actually Medina. You've uh, mentioned that MQ is actually from Pakistan. Yes. Uh, so how, how is this making sense in terms of him being a Mahdi? Look, so the hadiths say that the Mahdi will emerge in Medina. It does not say he'll be born there. Many people assume, and this is an incorrect assumption, because it says he will he will go from here to there and he, he will be among the people of, bro, I'm among the people of Britain. Does that mean I'm British? <laughs> you can see I'm not British. I'm, a, I'm, 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 an, I'm an Asian, but I'm amongst these people. Can he not be visiting and then be amongst the people of Medina and then come out? It's your understanding and your perception which is incorrect here. Now there's a hadith which states that the, the, the Mahdi will come from the east. A man will come from the east from my progeny. They will come with black banners. Even if you have to crawl across um, snow, go to him because that is the Khalifa Allah. 
So I've seen a video of you uh, that you uploaded on uh, your TikTok um, explaining a dream where uh, Prophet Muhammad, Salam peace be upon Salam. him, says that Muhammad Qasim is the Mahdi. I assume Muhammad Qasim told you that he is the Mahdi because he's had this dream and he's been instructed to share his dreams. Um, so why is he not coming out and claiming that he is the Mahdi if that's what he's, he's been instructed to share his dreams? He's been instructed to tell people what he sees in his dreams. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam come into your dreams and give you a command, you obey them. So just for clarity's sake, did this dream actually happen? Did Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, appear in his dream and say, Muhammad Qasim, you are the Mahdi? No, he did not. Okay. What actually happened was that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke to him and said, Qasim, do you know what the first major sign is? It is you. That's what he said. So we are led to believe now that Muhammad Qasim is the first major sign of uh, end of times? We're not led to believe. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has spoken. And when you see Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a dream, my brother, mm. you have seen him, not the shaitan. So people who say, oh, it's a shaitan, it's a shaitan. A'uzu billah. You are calling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a liar. Many people will counter that and say that, you know, all of the minor signs haven't um, already occurred. What would you say to that? I, I say nothing to it. So what? Does that mean that because the minor signs haven't finished that the major ones can't happen? I mean, we're already seeing that there is, there is potential scientifically for the sun to rise from the west soon. And you guys are worried about the minor signs when we're starting to see the beginning, the beginning um, things starting to come into play for the major signs. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cease when the sun rises from the west. And every man or woman or child who did not believe before it will remain like that. They will not believe after, despite seeing the truth. Even if they try to believe, it will not be, it will not be counted. Okay, but I've read a dream, uh, one of Muhammad Qasim's dreams, where he is the one that actually kills the Dajjal. Many people interpret the hadiths saying that it's actually Jesus will be the one to kill the Dajjal. So yes. what's, what's going on there? So, so with, when it comes to the Dajjal, this topic of Isa alayhi salam and Dajjal, there is so many different perceptions and perspectives and understandings about this. From the dreams, we know that the Muslims defeat the Dajjal. But then he returns later on and he returns in anger and he sees that Islam has spread across the entire globe. And that is when he comes at his full strength. When he comes at his full strength, he cannot be stopped except at the time when Isa alayhi salam comes. Whilst we're on that subject, has uh, Jesus appeared in um, Muhammad Qasim's dreams at all? Peace yes, so um, there have been a couple of dreams where um, uh, Isa uh, alayhi salam has been seen in, in the dreams of Muhammad Qasim. And actually, I asked, I asked questions about this, but he was uncomfortable dis dis discussing this with me at the time because of we had guests, etc. And I probably asked him at the wrong time, but yeah. he's a very sincere man. So when I, uh, when I looked into hadiths and stuff, and I looked at what he was saying, so he said that, um, you know, know uh, he said that he led the prayer and Isa alayhi salam was behind him and there was also a, a, another dream where he was on a train with the people who believe and he was heading towards uh, the direction where Isa alayhi salam was coming down and he saw Isa alayhi salam descending and actually then we the, the train itself was being attacked by Ya'juj wal Ma'juj so as we know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said that we're at the end of time when the major signs happen it will be like cutting of the beads and it will be falling off like this and it will happen at this day. So to think that one thing will happen and then there'll be a period of time, then one thing will happen, will be a period of time. This, this kind of conflicts that hadith because it doesn't happen very, very quickly within each other's periods. So the fact that the Ya'juj Majuj have escaped and that uh, Isa alayhi salam are there, is, is descending from the sky, this in itself is an evidence that helps that hadith. Not that the hadith needs help, but it actually supports that that hadith is correct, that the things will happen simultaneously almost. So just for clarity, um, the hadiths don't necessarily say it will be Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, that will be the one to kill the jar. So it's left open for interpretation. Is that what you're saying? So um, there is, uh, I'll give you a hadith, which is from uh, the Musnad of ah Abdul Razak. There are three things um, that was meant is mentioned uh, in the way that the, the, the jar will be killed. Okay, so the first way is by the sky, by the divine intervention. Then the second is the collapse of the earth, sinking of the Dajjal. And the third one is killing him by your weapons. And the people will choose the third option. So there will be blows from, from the Mahdi, from Isa alayhi salam. Allah knows best if it's the, 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 the blow from Isa alayhi salam that is the one that finishes the Dajjal off.
So what do you say to the people who are questioning uh, Muhammad Qasim's uh, mental health? Um, so there is um, a psychiatrist who actually checked him over um, and he did a thorough um, assessment on him. Uh, he didn't need any medication. Muhammad Qasim doesn't take any medication for any sort of mental instability or anything like that. He is actually, um, he's he's of sane. Uh, he, he, the, the psychiatrist determined that this man is a truthful man. Like he's, he doesn't. Um, show any signs of being a liar, nor does he have any uh, issues from childhood that affect his brain and the way he he does his day to day stuff. I mean, I have sat with him and I've watched him uh, fix air conditioning units, uh, UPS, you know, uh, universal power supplies. I've seen him fix very complicated stuff. I've seen him do welding on electrical devices and stuff. And for a man to be mentally unstable or, or, or have some sort of mental issues, for him to be able to do such complex tasks, like what I've seen him, what I've witnessed him do with my own eyes, I, I find it's very difficult for people to to think that this man has um, any sort of mental issues. I've sat with him; he's a very transparent person. He don't he don't show you something he's not. If he's upset, he shows you he's upset. If he's sad, he shows you he's upset. He's sad. If he is content and happy, he will show you he's content and happy. He smiles when he's happy. He's you know he's a regular guy. It's not just that, bro. We've even had somebody called uh, Ben Halima Abdul Rauf. He's a very popular uh, person on, on on social media in terms of um, doing gin catchings and removing gins etc. from from people and helping people with issues with gins. People have even resorted to saying this guy is possessed by jinns. He must be having jinn influence. And Abdul Rauf himself confirmed in an email, which is in the 27 minute documentary that you guys can watch on the Call of the Covenant YouTube channel, right? That he himself has confirmed by email that there is nothing happening with him in relation to jinns. The jinns know nothing about this individual. They don't, there is no influence there. There is nothing affecting him and he is not possessed by anything either. I've seen on your lives um, that you openly say that Muhammad Qasim is the Mahdi. Is he the Mahdi? Yes. Has he told you to say that? No. What does he think about that? He doesn't, I don't think he knows that I'm saying that he's the Mahdi. What would he think if he did know that you were saying that he is the Mahdi? I think he'd be upset with me. I think he'd be upset with me. But I'm not here to please him. I'm here to please my Lord and his Nabi. I'm here to do the work which they have asked us to do. And... You know, this, this whole situation, is, is, everyone says, how can you claim him to be the Mahdi when um, uh, he hasn't had the issue of the, the Bayar hasn't happened at the, at, in, in Makkah and the Baydar incident hasn't occurred? Well, actually, I think you will realize that there is a bunch of people who at the issue, at, at the time of the Bayar, they recognize him as the Mahdi. They give him bayah. It's not the scholars like everyone is saying. It, the scholars don't recognize it. The scholars only say, actually, we will confirm that this is the Mahdi because these people, the, the, the army from Syria has been swallowed up. So now we are telling you he's the Mahdi. Let's find him and let's go and give bayah to him. Yeah, but people will say that, you know, there's been so many claimants of being the Mahdi. Uh, for example, the Grand Mosque seizure in 1979. Yeah. Uh, we all know uh, that they actually went to the Kaaba and there was, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. people actually died. Held him at gunpoint. Yeah, and people were following this man, believing he is uh, the Mahdi. Yeah. And they believed wholeheartedly that he was the Mahdi. Well, claiming... What's the difference between uh, people that believe Muhammad Qasim is the Mahdi and the people that believe that that fake Mahdi was the Mahdi at the time? There are many claimants, but he is not a claimant because he is not claiming to be the Mahdi. This is the simple thing. He's not claimed and he never will claim. He has said this publicly, even on, on, on interviews, TV interviews. He said it publicly to, and he always says it and he, he remains steadfast on this. I will not make any big claims. These are big claims to make. As we know, the Mahdi will be uh, he will. People will call him the Mahdi. He will be identified as the Mahdi. The Mahdi will not proclaim to be the Mahdi, as Yasser Qadi, Doctor Yasser Qadi, has stated in some of his speeches. The Mahdi. Anyone who claims to be the Mahdi is instantly disqualified mm. from being the Mahdi. But the thing is, you're claiming him to be I, the Mahdi. But I'm not the Mahdi, and I'm saying he's the Mahdi. He's not. It's not coming from him. If he says it from his own mouth. Do you think I'm going to be sitting here trying to defend him? So you're creating your own movie, your own film script by uh, claiming that Muhammad Qasim is the Mahdi. Yeah, what would you I, say to that? Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting question that you ask because it's also a difficult question because we're not creating anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing him these dreams. 
He has commanded him to spread these dreams. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said that the person who helps you is like the person who is helping me, and the person who is a companion of yours is like a companion of mine. And Allah subhanahu wa taala has stated as well, as well as Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a in another dream, that the person who helps you, Allah subhanahu wa taala, is writing their names down with gold ink on gold paper. This is what is happening. Now, if you want to help him, then help him. There is no force for anybody to help him or support him. There is no force. There is no compulsion in Islam. There is no compulsion in believing in these dreams. There is none. However, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said in another dream that if Muhammad Qasim came to you with a message that was different to the message of Ibrahim alayhi salam when he destroyed the idols at, the t- at that time and different to the message I I brought. Which, uh, which was when I destroyed the idols at the, the conquest of Makkah, then indeed you would be correct in rejecting him and pushing him away. But he is not coming with a message different to that of Ibrahim alayhi salam, nor is it different to the message that I am bringing. Therefore, you have disobeyed. Even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not calling these people kafirs. He is not making takhfir upon them. He is still calling them Muslims, but they have disobeyed. And it is not, I understand there is a hesitation here, bro. I really do. Because sometimes I actually sit down and ask myself, say to myself, am I, am I the one going crazy here? Like, maybe I'm the one that's wrong. Maybe I'm just seeing things in a weird way because I'm a crazy guy. Maybe. But you know, when I think about movies, isn't it the crazy guy that is always the one that's left at the end? So how do you handle that? I've seen on, on your lives and on your videos, people commenting, um, you know, really horrible things, abuse. How do you take that? How do you get up in the morning and continue on? Um, spreading Muhammad Qasim's dreams. And how does Muhammad Qasim feel about um, all of this abuse he's receiving online? So, look, when it comes to the people online, I, I don't even take it with a pinch of salt, bro. People say, I've had death threats. I've had people try to kill me. I've had people try to face off to me. None of this bothers me because I run to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every time and I'm still here doing this. I'm trying to help people. People are trying to kill me. It doesn't bother me. It really doesn't. And, you know... Do you know what I feel? It's difficult for me to talk about the subject of the Ummah because I really care about the Ummah. I want to help the Ummah. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I have not just listened to what the dreams are saying. I'm not listening to Qasim. I'm listening to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger are saying in these dreams. And the messages are so pure. And when you apply that information that is coming, I'm, I, I, my connection with Allah has got so strong. I started this off with no beard. I don't even know where this thing came from. I, my whole persona has changed. I've become better as a person. And that man has not taught me one single thing. I have listened to his dreams and it has changed my life. I genuinely and sincerely have this belief and I feel a connection with Allah when I prayed. When before, I had no connection. I could not feel a physical connection. And what was the main message? Tawheed, eradicating it in all its forms. And when I did that, I felt this real thing. And when I started telling people about this, despite all of the abuse I was getting, I continued and continued and continued to try to help them and ask Allah to forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. And you know what happened? Sooner or later, it just even in the last few days, there have been people who have been coming forward saying, bro, I listened to what you said. And you know what? I am feeling that connection you are talking about. I'm feeling the difference when I've removed these forms of shit from my life. And I'm seeing that, that Allah is helping me. Now, all the dreams are saying is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Qasim, there has never been more shit on earth than there has ever been in the entire history of mankind. And when we eradicate this, the help of Allah will come. Now, if it happens for us as individuals, there is no doubt it will happen for us as an ummah can we just rewind a little bit there because there might be some people watching who don't know what shirk is can you explain to us what shirk is so shirk has uh, shirk is the association of partners or elevating anybody up to the level of the creator himself um, taking on any of his attributes as your own and associating partners with him but also its associations so if somebody makes a picture for example this is, we know from the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that the person who creates images, they will be asked to give it life on the day of judgment and they won't be able to. And then they will be thrown into the fire along with, that, with those images as well. They will be given life and being thrown into the fire as well with them. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using this as a demonstration. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ has given, used the example that it will be the most severe of punishments on the day of judgment. Now we know from Quran and from Hadith, that Allah punishes the people the most severest on the Day of Judgment for the act of shirk. Now, associating shirk and its forms, how it's how it's um, evolved from previously to today, 
people don't even realize it's on their clothes. People don't realize it's in their cupboards. People don't realize it's in their bathrooms. In their, in their, uh, it, I mean, kids, they're completely overwhelmed with it. People will be saying, hold up, shirk is when you're actually praying to an, an ornament or something like that. So you're saying it's, it could be anything printed on something in your cupboard, something you're wearing in a t-shirt. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes, of course, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that these images that represent, look, even in Judaism, the second commandment is thou shalt not make any graven images that resemble anything in the heavens and the earth. Anything that has a soul, whether it be an animal, a person, a dragon, or something that you've created from your own mind. You are you are competing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are you not taking on the attribute of Al-Khaliq, the creator, by doing these things? I mean, you think about it, you have a piece of paper there, you might draw a picture. When you rub it out, there is still a graven image on there because the pen pencil itself has created a mark in that paper. Yeah, but people will say, you know, I'm not creating that image. If there's an image on my, you know, packet of cornflakes, how is that shirk? It's just um, something in my cupboard and it's, it's, you know, I'm not creating any sort of ornaments or anything like that. How's that shirk? Surely, if anything, at the very least, it's just haram. No, it's not just haram. This is what the ulama say. It is actually a form of shirk. It is not shirk in, a, in and of itself in the fact that this is an image that you have purchased from the shop. You know, it's very easy. And even if it is haram, is, I ask you a question, Shak, yeah? Is shirk forbidden? Yes. Yes? Mm. Okay. Now, is everything that is forbidden shirk? No. No. Why would you say no? I have a very interesting point to make. Because the general consensus is shirk is when you're uh, putting something next to Allah in the same sort of greatness and, you know, you might be, you know, praying praying towards it or something like that. In the Quran, in Surah Luqman, the biggest oppression, uh, the biggest injustice is shirk. Not anything else. Shirk is the biggest oppression that we have on ourselves. Okay. In another, um, in, in the Quran, uh, in Surah Hud, it is mentioned in there, you have not brought to us clear evidence. You have not brought to us clear evidences, clear proof. Therefore, we will not leave our gods on your say-so, nor will we believe you. The Quran was sent for every generation. That applies, That those verses apply here right now. Because we are telling people about these forms of shirk. They're saying, you didn't bring us any clear proof that this is shirk. Mm. These are forms of shirk. Therefore, we will not leave these. The Quran is identifying those as gods. We will not leave our gods just because you told us this is shirk. And we don't believe you. People are not leaving these items because they don't because we didn't bring them clear proof. Nor and they're making the the choice, the the conscious choice, not to leave it. And they are saying we will not believe you. You're calling them a liar. On top of that, now that situation applies to this very same thing that we are having right now. And you know what that was very scary about this? They didn't even say the brother is saying that this is a form of shirk. Let me go and check. So they're disobeying the Quran again. Surah Al-Hujra, verse 6. If somebody brings news to you, a farsik, a wicked person, treat me like a wicked person, I don't care. But if somebody brings you news, you inquire into it, lest you harm a people in ignorance. In ignorance. Okay, but what about things like ID? What about a passport? I need my picture in the passport. Am so, I committing shirk because I've got no, a picture in my passport or no, my ID in my pocket? We don't live at the time of the Prophet Wasallam. We live in the 21st century. Life has changed. The world has changed. And some of the situations around us, we have no control over. So you need ID to be able to do some things that you do. If, if it is something that is required and it serves a purpose, this is absolutely fine. It serves its purpose. At the time it no longer serves its purpose, you should put it away. There are some things that we simply don't have any control over. And at the time that this is going to be changed, then everything changes. But the world has to change around it for, the, for, that, for those situations to be ideal for the Muslims. There's been a famous Mufti, Mufti Menk. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's, he's gone on record speaking about Muhammad Qasim <laughs> and he, he, he said he, he's advised people to ignore dreams. Um, you know, if you look into it too much, it will drive you cuckoo. Um, what do you say to Mufti Menk? So um, I'm very well versed on that. And I went through my own spiritual experience during that whole thing. And, uh, you know, um, I was very disappointed when I saw his response. I understood where he was coming from. But, you know, a mufti of 20, 30 years of experience, 
um, coming out with an unacademic emotional outburst on Instagram, on social media, saying that I have seen 50 cases like this before and I saw these videos and I laughed so hard that my belly hurts and these people have something wrong with them mentally and these people should go and seek help from a doctor and all these sort of things. This tells us, I mean, instantly I, I saw I saw this video and my heart broke because I listened to Mufti Menk. But you know what I've decided to do with all the scholars now? I've decided to take what is good and leave what is bad. I hold no enmity towards the brother. I just want to help him and I want to ask him because it doesn't matter whether you are a new believer or, an old, or, or a believer since birth. Everybody has some value to share. Mm. So you should never disregard people's value. And one of the things that he, I feel that he did not do is that he didn't investigate into this matter properly and adequately. And I made a 10-minute response for Mufti Menk. You guys can find that on the Call of the Covenant YouTube channel. I made a 10-minute response explaining to him that we're not just a group of people that are based in Pakistan. These are people from every single nation on earth, from different backgrounds, from different Akidas. This is another message from the dreams that we have to unite as an ummah. There are people who don't even agree Islamically, but they agree on this. They're coming from different Akidas. Different schools of thought, different backgrounds, different heritages, different countries, different languages from all places around the world, unconnected. And they're coming under one banner. Tawheed. Tawheed. La ilaha illallah. Isn't this what Islam was built upon? So obviously my heart broke when I heard about this. And when I watched his video, and then I, got, I, I, I became angry inside because I felt that he did not do his investigation as commanded in the Quran properly. Because he said, oh, I've done 50 cases. This is just another one of those cases but you didn't provide your evidence. I would have expected at the very least an, an, an academic response. This is the very least we should expect from the ulama. We're not complicated people. We're, we're laymans. But at least respond with something from Quran or something from the hadith which says that this is lies. But there is no, there, there was nothing there. Which makes me think that if you were not able to respond in an academic uh, way, then explain to me why are we wrong? I even asked Mufti Menk directly in a message on TikTok. I, I asked him, I asked him for help. I asked him for guidance. I gave the salam to him. He did not return my salam. May Allah forgive him. I don't even hold nothing against him. But he blocked me. He took the time to go onto my profile, go onto the arrow button and click block. He was you, was you like sending him loads of me hundred messages or something no, a day? No, I, I just sent him one long, long message. I mean, he, he, I think he recognizes who I am. You know, from the videos that I post and from the videos from the call of the covenant, I think he recognizes who I am. Now, if I have hurt the brother, may Allah forgive me for this and I'm seeking his, his forgiveness as well. There, uh, nothing I have done, I do not wish to harm or hurt, hurt any brother, especially Mufti Menk, especially Yasir Qadi or Numan Ali Khan or anybody. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to harm anybody. I'm trying to help because I believe sincerely that this is something big and we need help. We spent years contacting these people by email and they don't respond to them. Well, let's hope uh, Mufti Menk sees this interview uh, and, inshallah. and uh, inshallah he will uh, reach out or, you know, he will unblock you and um, <laughs> inshallah, you guys inshallah, can actually discuss and um, you give him, you know, the, your research and he can look into it properly. Inshallah, inshallah. Ta inshallah ta so have you actually met Muhammad Qasim? Yes. Or is this all online? No, no, I've met him. I've met him in real life. So About you've that. been to Pakistan? I Yeah, for the first time in my whole life, I went to Pakistan in September. Okay, tell First us about time. that. Oh man, it was absolutely amazing. So um, I don't tend to talk about my dreams, but I will just say that I had dreams about the way that the way I met him before I even knew he was a person, before I knew he was a real guy. When I met him, all of these dreams started flooding back. I've seen this road, I've seen this, I've seen this area, I've seen this house, I've seen p things inside his house I've seen in my dreams. I'm oh, like, wow. I, I was so bamboozled, bro. The, the, there was a person who was with him. My, my ham, la, la ilaha illallah. There's a brother called Abdul Qureshi. I, I feel like this guy and me, we're going to be best friends in Jannah. You know, I even saw this guy there. He was there as well. He was also in my dream. The clothing he was wearing, Muhammad Qasim. People look at him, say he's a weak guy, this, that, and the other. But you know, the brother, he came and he took my heavy suitcase and he took it into the house. Allahu Akbar. I, you know, he, he welcomed me into his home. He welcomed mm. me into his home. I met his beautiful mother, his kind, soft-hearted, merciful mother. Subhanallah, such a beautiful, beautiful, soft and very honorable woman. I met her. She's so humble and, you know, she's very peaceful. And she's constantly, you know, doing the zikr of Allah and praying to the creator. And she's, you know, doing her best. La ilaha illallah. He comes from a noble household. It's just evident in everything that I saw. When I met him, he was nothing I expected. I had no expectations. When I went down, I'm going to find the truth about this guy. I so, went there to expose him. 
Oh, you did? I went there to expose okay. him. I didn't go there to go and sit there and be his best friend, no. I went there to expose him. I went there to see, let me see if I can find any flaws in him directly. Did because, you? No, I didn't. He's very transparent. He's a truthful guy. He really is a truthful guy. He, he He's everything that I was not expecting. One thing is, yeah, I've, uh, he's got a PDF. It's, it's a, just over 300 pages long and I've read probably 90% of it. Mashallah. Um I'd just like to point out, uh, a lot of his dreams do seem to be centred around Pakistan and Pakistani politics. Um, there's roughly 1.8 billion Muslims in the world and there's only around 200 million Muslims, um, only I say lightly, in, in Pakistan. Yeah. So if he if the message was to it was meant to reach, you know, the whole world, the whole Ummah, why are so many of his dreams centered around Pakistan, Pakistani politics? It, some people might may say that this is some sort of strategy to get into the political field. Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. So um I'm gonna say quite clearly and quite blatantly, democracy is shirk. This whole voting system and everything that we have, it's a form of shirk. For the Muslims, you should quite blight, quite quite obviously say that this is a form of shirk. We should only be voting for Muslims. We should only be voting for uh, the law of Allah to be established. This is what we should say. They'll come out with, oh, but you have to obey the law of the land, etc. Yes, but you shouldn't com should conflict your own beliefs. La ilaha illallah, fit Allah, all of you. So, and I, I'm not somebody who makes rulings or nothing like that. I have my own mind. Allah gave me this mind and I will go into my own grave. So I'm here defending myself and I speak for myself when I speak, by the way. I don't represent the whole Muslim Ummah. I don't do that. Okay. So when it comes to the, the dreams and the Pakistani politics, etc. Islam is going, true Islam is going to rise from Pakistan. Pakistan is also known as the pure land. Now, as corrupt as it is right now. So what? Can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not... Put, when you want to hide something, you put it in the most worst of place where no one will even think to look for it. Bringing me to that point, a lot of people say, uh, you know, the, the Mahdi is meant to be from uh, Khorasan. Is Pakistan in Khorasan? No, the, so the hadith is before, before Khorasan. Right. The, you know that there's a, there's a, a hadith which states that the Dajjal will come from Khorasan. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So these two eschatological uh, figures, which are polar opposites, and they both come from the same, similar region. So the land before Khorasan is, is actually used to be called Sindh. And if you look on the, I think it's a Sassanid empire. This is the maps at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah forgive me if I'm wrong, but you can confirm this information from the 27 minute documentary on the Call of the Covenant YouTube channel. Yeah, we're looking to add the references. Yeah. So, so if you look into that, there'll be the map there. Look on that map, you will see that the land before Khorasan is actually Pakistan. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's actually there on the map of the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We have many people coming and trying to debate us and we're not here to debate. We're here to just clarify what we have found in our research and our investigation. They come to us with maps from the 1500s. We're, we're like, how can you use this as a map? The map is at the, you should be looking at the map of the time of the prophet, peace be upon him. Because he's speaking from that time. So why are we looking at maps in, 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 in 1500s or 1600s or 1700s? We should be looking at the time of when the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa speaking. Mm. I've seen a lot of people um, accuse this of you and um, others who are saying Muhammad Qasim is the Mahdi. Mm. Are you a paid agent? To spread misinformation. <laughs> no, I'm being I'm being no, real. In, this, in you, these bro. times of days, you know, <laughs> it's we've got people spreading misinformation online, yeah, fake yeah, accounts, yeah. bots, right. and this and that. Yeah, you're right, man. Is so, this true? No, this is not true. Wallahi, I don't get paid for this. I, I, sorry, that's a lie. Subhanallah. Ya Allah, forgive me for lying. I, I, I'm stacking deeds. That's my payment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving me the good deeds for this. So Muhammad Qasim's not paying you? No, he's never given me one cent, bro. He, I say cent. Allah hu akbar. He never gave me one rupee. He's never given me a penny. I went to Pakistan and it was me. I happily, out of the money which people had given me, um, I, I took that money and I say people who gave me, I'm talking about my friends. They gave me a little bit of money to be able to support myself when I was there for my stay. I took my money and I wanted to feed him. I was feeding him. I was taking him out. We were getting food. We were getting takeaway. We were eating food. You know, I was happy to give him some food and I was my honor to give him food because despite what I, we are saying, he's the Mahdi, he's a human being. He's not just a human being. I believe he is a Sayyid. I believe he is a Sayyid. So I'm, ha I'm happily feeding someone who is related to the Prophet, peace be upon him. The, the descendants are all over the world and I would feed anyone. I even offered Musa Adnan, he's, He's like a student of knowledge. May Allah reward him for every, all the good work that he does. But, you know, I even offered Musa Adnan 
uh, to come to my home, I will feed him, I'll give him some tea. I've even offered him because I remember him saying to me on the live when he came, he came to the like to talk with us and discuss with us about what we're saying. And when he came, he's, you know, he said that, you know, some, like, some people in my family say that we're descended from the saints, from, from, from the Prophet Sallallahu family too. So I was like, okay, mashallah. But, you know, I'm just a lovely guy, man. I want to help the ummah. I want to show people that we are real people. You know what people forget? That we are people, bro. We have feelings and we have lives, you know. Why would I come up here to do this except that I'm doing it because I believe in something so much. I don't get paid, bro. You've seen this. I'm not funded. I'm not funded at all. Everything that I have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all the stuff that comes to me, I put it into this. And until somebody comes to me with a solid, solid evidence that Muhammad Qasim is a blatant liar, proof that he's a liar, there is no way I'm leaving this. Because what is needed for, for, to, to convince someone like me is proof and evidence. I have proof and evidence on my own research that everything I have done and ev all the research I've done has led me to believe that this man here, he is going to be the Imam al-Mahdi and that events that will take place will happen with him based on the dreams that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him, which is al-Mubashirat, which is one part of 46 parts of prophethood. The Prophet ﷺ said to the Sahaba, after I am gone, one part of 46 parts of prophethood will remain. And they asked, what is uh, Al-Mubashirat? And he said, it is true dreams, glad tidings. And um, if it turns out Muhammad Qasim is not the Mahdi, what happens to you? Where do you go from, from there? Define him not being the Mahdi. Does he die? Does he... Give me an, give me an example For of why instance, he wouldn't be the Mahdi. he passes away, God okay, forbid. Okay, so, so, so he, he passes away. We will all die, bro. No need to God forbid. We will all pass away one day. Yeah. He will die one day. I will die one day. So will you and so will all of our family members. We In that... If circumstance does, what happens to you where, where do you go from there i come out publicly i apologize publicly will you come back on on unchained i will come back on unchained i will even go to every single scholar i will i will find the money and i will fly to every single scholar i have refuted and i will apologize to them and i will seek their forgiveness directly to their faces i will go to all the people i will apologize publicly on the public platforms in which i have said these things and i will come out and i will be known as a liar but i will accept it because why one thing I have learned from all of this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. The only sin that he does not forgive is shirk. So it doesn't matter what I do. I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive me as long as I avoid that sin of shirk. And I seek repentance from him. There will be nobody who will doubt that Allah will forgive me um, because Allah is most merciful. So I would go to everybody and I would apologize to them. I would come up publicly. I'd come on any podcast I've been on. I would go to all the people I have... I have said things too that turned out to be wrong. I will go to every single one of them. And that would be a lot of people. But believe me, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep me alive to finish that. That is my intention. Turn to the camera. Okay. I am placing my hand on the Quran. I am saying, Wallahi, that may the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon the liar. Ameen. Ameen. In the same manner, that my brother Salat and all the brothers and sisters, including Yahya, have gone to the Kaaba and they have swore by Allah at the front of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Muhammad Qasim's dreams are true. They are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has spoken to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in his dreams and that it is a fact that he will be the Mahdi one day. And not everybody in the beginning will be amongst those people who will be among, uh, uh, there at the Bayah. This is a fact. On that note, NASA, aka MQ Dreams, thank you for joining me on today on Unchained. It's, it's been, been a pleasure, absolute, brother. It's been an absolute pleasure. Jazakallah khair for having me on, and I hope to see you again in the future, inshallah. inshallah. Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salamu alaikum.